But now, let's lift our hands one more time and pray. We're going to switch and move into this whole lesson of the tabernacle plan. And I'm going to reiterate just briefly some of the comments I made last night <clears throat> about the tabernacle plan and bring out some new points before I actually begin to teach the session. Let us pray. Jesus, revelation, understanding, once again, bind us together in one mind and one accord. I'm asking as the instructor of this School of Scriptures course and training program that these people will never be the same, that these truths, oh God, will become illumined in their minds and hearts, that you will use them mightily, that these will become the tools by which they can go forth and build for thee a kingdom, a kingdom, O oh God, a kingdom of holy and righteous people that will serve you, Lord, I pray. Let great revival continuously form and break out in this area. We give you praise, glory, and honor. I pray that this whole nation of Singapore will feel the effects of the prayers of this church, the power of these holy people that walk before you in fear and Oh God, in dedication and consecration, blessed, blessed be the name of the Lord. We give you praise, glory, and honor. Answer by fire. God, answer by fire. Help the government of this country to hear of this truth, this people that live within her borders. I'm asking in the name of the Lord Jesus, by your might and by your power, blessed be the name of Jesus of Nazareth forever. And everyone said, Amen. I do hope in your syllabus you will, uh, under the tabernacle plan in category number five, I do hope that you'll take time to look at page 59. It's just marvelous the things that are there that you can get into in depth in the study of the tabernacle plan. Then, of course, page 60, there are tabernacle plan references that show you all that you need to know. In addition to the verse, I'm going to begin the uh, flannel graph teaching session with. Also, I want to point out Galatians 3 and 24. The law, Galatians 3 and 24 says, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. In other words, the law really was a schoolmaster to bring us in the end to what we have in apostolic Christianity. And within the notes, you'll find out uh, all about uh, the, the decree that went forth in Exodus to let them make a sanctuary for the Lord, that he could dwell among men. And then in Hebrews 9, it talks about the, the high priest went alone into the holiest once a year. And there are all kinds of things there. We've already discussed that the high priest in the tabernacle wore a breastplate of 12 stones representing the 12 tribes of Israel. And uh, it was called the Urim and Thummim, or, or Urim Vetumen in Hebrew, which means light and truth. Uh, the high priest, uh, Aaron, was required by God to carry light and truth upon his heart before and for the people at all times. And that basic concept in truth is still imposed upon us as men of God in this hour. We are commanded by God to bear truth and light before us to the people. And then we discussed the five major offerings last night, the seven feasts of the Lord. Now, in this tabernacle <clears throat> plan, God gave Moses on Mount Sinai the Ten Commandments, but he gave him the tabernacle plan. This tabernacle was a portable church that could be set up and dismantled and carried uh, on their journeys from the pilgrimage from Egypt to the Promised Land. And they spent 40 years wandering in the wilderness because they failed at the promise of God and mocked and scoffed. And so they were turned back uh, into the wilderness for 40 years. But when they finally crossed over Jordan into the promised land, it was an incredible thing because 
<clears throat> they'd had this portable church all the way through, this tabernacle, wherein they worshipped and served God, and God met with them on a daily basis. An incredible plan, and the plan or the format carried through into the Temple of Solomon. Of course, once the Temple of Solomon was erected, then the tabernacle plan was dismantled. It was no longer needed uh, as they had their own nation, they had the capital in Jerusalem, etc., uh, and all of that before the kingdom was divided. But the, the tabernacle plan, the format, followed all the way through. It still exists uh, in a lot, in many details in Judaism today. And of course, it was definitely in the temple uh, that Herod built in Jerusalem at the time of Jesus' earthly ministry. There's some interesting sidelights to all of this before I actually get into the class and the flannel graph itself. <clears throat> I've been to Israel 19 times, and in the city of Jerusalem, there is, in, within the Jewish quarter, something called the Temple Institute. The Temple Institute, uh, Chaim Richman, I know him, I've been with him, and uh, spent some time with him. He's just an incredible rabbi. And I've asked him lots of questions. For me, uh, going to the Temple Institute is one of the major highlights of going to Jerusalem. And there is a woman there, her name is Esther. Uh, I haven't been there now in about eight years, but um, her lecture alone on the tabernacle, on the temple, to me, was worth the entire trip to Israel. She was absolutely incredible. In fact, she knows so much about it that the rabbis in Jerusalem, if they want to know uh, answers to questions about the temple or the tabernacle, they come to Esther. And she always agreed to lecture my particular tour group, and I always tipped her well at the end. And uh, she was just an incredible, incredible person, the things that she knew. It was her demeanor, it was also her spirit that she transmitted. But what's interesting about the Temple Institute, they are planning, they're making plans to build the next temple. Uh, when the Messiah returns. They're looking, they're praying for the Messiah fervently, and they're crying out to God to send the Messiah. That's sad in one way, isn't it? Because the very thing they're looking for lives in our hearts and souls on a daily basis. It's, it's, it's sad to me that the thing they wanted the most, the, the coming of the Messiah, they missed it. They were so busy fighting the Romans, they missed it. But if they'd pulled out the scrolls during the earthly ministry of Jesus and began to read the scrolls in the evening around their fires and, and, and compared the scrolls, the prophecies, what the prophets had declared, and then compared that with what this Jesus was doing in the countryside, they would have begun to shout with joy and said, look, he's got to be the one. It's written here, it's written here, it's written here. But what they were doing is, they were so busy fighting the Romans and taking care of just life in general, they missed the greatest advent in their entire history, the coming of the Messiah. And the thing I don't want to happen to us is to get so involved with current events and the cares of life and, and the world that we miss the next greatest event in history, the rapture, the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. We must keep diligently searching the scriptures because every day the news media is screaming, he's coming, he's coming. Every earthquake is saying, he's coming, he's coming. The earth has a voice. The Bible says in the last days there were earthquakes in diverse places, thousands of earth tremors, major tremors every day taking place. Jesus is literally coming. And if we know anything about Bible prophecy, surely he will come within our lifetime. Won't it be a wonderful thing to just be walking along somewhere and take a step and your foot will catch on the air and never touch the sidewalk or the carpet again? You'll just begin to feel yourself lifting and going. There'll be the sound of a trumpet, the voice of the archangel, the shout of God. Wonderful where we are at this hour. But in this Temple Institute, they have, they have made a solid gold crown for the high priest to wear. They've got the miters, they've got the linen robes, they've got the, uh, the, the shovels, the basins, they've got uh, everything. It's made of solid gold. It's, it, it's absolutely incredible. They were working on the breastplate when I was there. The, the, the monumental mammoth thing, of course, is the candlestick because it was solid gold. And it's, it's uh, I don't know how large they will make it, but they're preparing for 
this, the building of the next temple. And here's what's interesting about this. This is fascinating to me. The artist are making these vessels for the next temple, the basins, the lavers, and all of the uh, furniture, the candlesticks, and everything. The table of showbed, all of that. The artist that are now making these vessels. You can walk in and see them. They're there. The artist can trace their genealogies and their lineage back to the same families of artists who made these vessels for Solomon's temple. They are descendants of the artist through the centuries that made the vessels for the temple of Solomon. That's incredible. So as we go into this, you'll see there's a lot of gold and silver as you read through your notes and as I lecture here tonight. <clears throat> here are these Hebrew children, three to six million, depending on what authority you read after. Here they are out in the middle of the desert, and they've been slaves for 400 years. Where did they get all this gold and silver and all these, this, these rich tapestries and linen and all of this fabric to make and build such a magnificent structure as the tabernacle? Where'd they get it? The Bible says they borrowed from the Egyptians. The Bible says they spoiled the Egyptians. They took the gold and the silver from the Egyptian women, the bracelets, the rings, the, the, the necklaces, all the things, the furniture, the chaise lounges. They literally, when they left Egypt, they spoiled literally the Egyptians. You say, well, that's stealing. No, 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 no. Back pay for 400 years of slavery. That is where they got the gold and the silver to make this incredible portable church in the wilderness. And again, I reiterate, the format, the plan of this tabernacle exists even to our day. <clears throat> the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 10, 11, let's read together. Now all these things happened unto them for examples, and they are written for our admonition. So, during the time of Moses, and when the tabernacle plan was inaugurated and brought into the camp for the Hebrew children to worship in, and that God might dwell among them, if you walked upon the camp of the Hebrew children, it would look something like this. The tabernacle, if you notice, was placed in the center of the entire encampment. The millions camped around the tabernacle. It means this for us. God should be the center of your life. The tabernacle was never pitched at the back of the camp, at the side of the camp, in front of the camp. It was pitched directly in the middle of the entire encampment. God should be the center of your life. And the interesting thing about the tabernacle, the people camped around in tents, etc. But there was a cloud that covered this camp by day. And by night, that cloud turned into a pillar of fire. So it must have been very disconcerting, even fearful at times, for the enemy to try to do whatever they willed to do against these, what they considered to be uh, just a wandering mass of Bedouin people traveling through their lands. But if they came upon them in the day, that cloud mysteriously just hung there and shielded them from the hot desert sun. So if they decided to come back for a surprise attack at night, 
that cloud turned into a pillar of fire, meaning that the people of God are never without light and never without his protective power. And when the devil comes around us, there is a cloud that covers us a fire by night, as it were. We are protected from the wiles of the devil. We are protected from the enemies of our souls. And this was the greatest event or the greatest thing that the Hebrew children constantly watched. If that cloud stayed stationary, when they got up, woke up in the morning, they stuck their heads out of these tents to look at the cloud. If it was stationary, they could sleep in. If that cloud was moving, that meant they had to get up, roll up those tents, and the cloud was beginning to move, and they had to move with the cloud. In other words, if they didn't move with the cloud, they would be left at the rear of the encampment and destroyed by the enemy. What does that mean for us? It means that when the Spirit of God is moving, you had better pick up yourself and move with the Spirit. You better move with the Spirit. It's something, when the water is troubled, get in while the water is troubled. It's amazing. It's amazing to me. People will come to services, and when the power of God is mighty, they just stand back and watch. Then when the spirit of fellowship takes over, they come down and say, I just went to the doctor today. I'm dying in a month with cancer. Would you pray for me? The answer is no. You should have got in while the Spirit of God was moving. When the Spirit of God is moving, move with the Spirit. Come out of your seat. Push somebody out of the way. Get them out of the way, but get into the moving of the Spirit. They had to get to that pool of Bethesda when the water was troubled. The first one that got in the water was healed. Don't wait till the water settles down. It's too late. It's too late. Get in while the Spirit of God is moving. You say, well, I don't want to be rude. Who cares what people think? Get what you came for. If you have to push some over, just push them over. But you get it. That woman with the issue of blood, it's possible she crawled, but she got there. And when she touched him, she was healed. Clap your hands for just a moment. God, help us to forever move with your Spirit. Utokarahashaya. In fact, I have done a lot of research from Jewish sources. It says that the mass of people was so great that sometimes as the cloud was moving and they moved uh, all day long, to move six will, will be considered three million people, conservative, three million people. All of this had to be, to be just, you know, dissembled and, and, and put and carried at the end of the day, those at the back of the crowd may not have moved very many feet at all. It just was a very slow process. Can you imagine living like that for 40 years? But when they moved to a new location and got there, and they set, set up camp, this was established in the center of the camp. Because God, I reiterate, should be the center of your life. This tabernacle plan faced the east, and there were, you'll find this in your notes, there were certain tribes that camped right in front to the entrance that carried the tabernacle, carried the furniture, etc., uh, etc., et and that's all very interesting. But for tonight, this tabernacle faced the east. It always faced the rising of the sun. There's a reason for that. But as you walk up to the tabernacle itself, this outer enclosure was 150 feet long and 75 feet wide. 150 feet long and 75 feet wide. This fence was white linen. There was a reason for that. Because if you walked up to the fence, the whiteness of the fence would make you very much aware of any soil on your garments. When you come into the presence of God, you become very much aware of your sinful nature and His holiness. This fence was seven and a half feet high, just a little bit taller than the average individual, because it was written, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. 
most people that wanted to look over into this fell just short of being, being able to look over into the glory and the power and the majesty of God. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Notice, there's only one gate in this tabernacle plan. Jesus said, I am the door, I am the way and the life. If you try to get in by any other means, the same as a thief and a robber, you couldn't crawl under this fence, you couldn't climb over it, you had to come through the gate. The gate was 30 feet wide, but the entrance to the tabernacle was only 15 feet wide. It is written, straight is the gate and narrow is the way, and few there be that find it. That's what that's all about. These Jews worshipped in type and shadow the entire New Testament dispensational church. There were four posts that held up this gate or this door that represented the four Gospels that held up Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And you had to come to this particular gate. When you came to this gate, when the animal sacrifices were brought here, that's where the struggle was. The struggle was at this gate because the animals could smell the burning flesh and the smoke of the sacrifices on this brazen altar here, which was the first piece of furniture. There were seven pieces of furniture uh, allocated in this tabernacle plan. There was the brazen altar, there was the laver, inside the tabernacle was the candlestick, the table of showbread, the altar of incense, the veil, and then the uh, Ark of the Covenant behind the veil, which you'll see before the class is over. But this, the struggle was here. The animals feared. They felt a fear. This brazen altar was a type of repentance. When a human being comes to God, when a sinner walks in where the presence of God is moving, that's where the battle begins, the struggle begins, because God is a consuming fire, and they can feel the convicting power of Almighty God, and the struggle begins. That's why the Bible says, present your body a living sacrifice unto God, which is your reasonable service. Just as in this tabernacle, the animal struggled, it was slain, and it was, became a burnt offering here. But once a sinner presents himself to God, it changes totally, which we will discuss inside the tabernacle itself. This brazen altar was made out of brazen brass. It was seven and a half feet by seven and a half feet by four and a half feet high. When this tabernacle was instituted or inaugurated or dedicated in its first service. When they brought the animal sacrifice here, fire fell from this cloud and set the altar on fire. That fire never was allowed to go out from that time on. Even when they dismantled the tabernacle and traveled, they had to wrap the ashes of this fire, or the coals, the, the burning coals of this brazen altar in ashes and carry them. So the fire was continuously the same fire. It began by God, and they carried it. So this was a type of repentance. It was a brazen altar. The second piece of furniture was not just brazen brass, it was mirrored brass. In other words, the closer you get to the glory of God inside this tabernacle, the more valuable the material becomes that the furniture is made out of. So we're going from a, a slaying death sacrificial experience here to fire and smoke here and brazen brass a fire that never went out. In other words, you could avail yourself of this altar any time of day or night. Anyone in the camp could avail themselves of this altar of repentance, type of repentance, any time of day or night. But the next piece of furniture was this 
mirrored this laver of water. No one knows exactly its dimensions. We do know it was made out of mirrored brass. In other words, the women surrendered their polished brass looking glasses or mirrors for the making of this laver. In other words, they surrendered their vanity to the house of God is what they did. And this laver was so highly polished that when the priest walked up to this laver, if there were any spots on their robes, it was reflected in the brightness and the mirror-like quality of the surface of this laver. And at this laver, every priest that entered the service of the priesthood was washed at this laver from head to foot. That's why we baptize by immersion, because Aaron was the first high priest, and he, Moses washed him from head to foot. It was a type of baptism by immersion. And if they were not washed here and walked into the holy place, they dropped dead. So they had to wash here because it was a type of baptism. So you've got, you've got repentance and you've got baptism here. Inside this, the tabernacle was <clears throat> a rectangular shape. And inside the first half or portion, it was the holy place. Behind the veil was the holiest of holies. So when you get inside, it becomes totally different than what you see out here. This represents the Shekinah glory of God that fell on the Day of Atonement. Shekinah means wrath. And it was the wrath of God that fell on the sacrifice, the blood that was sprinkled by the high priest. So we can lift this. Now, the Hebrew children told anyone who wanted to know, or any of the children that was born among them, we have the truth. God dwells with us. God dwells among us. And he's in the center of this camp. There's a tabernacle in which he dwells. For any passerby or stranger, they would tell them the same. God dwells in this tabernacle. So, when those who came to see this great dwelling place of this great God who had delivered them out of Egyptian bondage, who performed the miraculous in the wilderness, when they got to the tabernacle, they simply saw a rectangular box. It didn't have any spires or steeples. It was just a rectangular box. And it was covered on the outside with badger skins. I mean, it's not that impressive. What they did not know there were four coverings on that tabernacle. Once you get through the badger skin experience of repentance, which is not attractive, what they did not know, under that layer of badger skins, there was a second layer, curtain. It was ram skins dyed red. Once you get through the badger skin experience of repentance and you get baptized in Jesus' name, the power of the blood of Jesus Christ becomes of utmost importance to you and you find you're entering, beginning to walk into the glory and the power of God and his total redemptive power in your life. It was a type of the blood that is applied at water baptism. What the passerby stranger did not know, underneath this ramskin dyed red, there was another curtain, and it was made of cashmere. It was goat's hair. It was absolutely luxurious. 
Once they got through the badger skin experience of repentance, and they got through uh, the type and shadow of this washing, they fell, began to fall into the soft, velvety presence of the reality of God. What they didn't know was under, under this layer of cashmere, there was a fourth curtain that was absolutely magnificent. It was, the woof was linen, white, but it was embroidered in blue for the heavenlies, purple for royalty, and scarlet for the blood of Jesus. It was magnificent, magnificent. So you got repentance, water baptism, and the type and shadow of coming into the presence and glory of God in this tabernacle. If you understand what I just said here, if they failed to wash at this laver and walked into the holy place, they fell dead. If you understand that from the tabernacle, then you'll understand why in Acts chapter 10, when the Holy Ghost fell in the household of Cornelius and Peter was preaching, Peter, the Holy Ghost fell on them while he was preaching. He commanded them, when they started speaking with tongues, to be baptized in Jesus' name. He didn't say, think about it, we'll give you a Bible study next week. On the spot, he commanded them to be baptized in Jesus' name. The reason is because he knew this plan. They had bypassed the labor. They had walked in here without being washed. That's why he commanded them to be baptized in Jesus' name. In fact, they have, I've done some research on this from the stacks that I mentioned in, in old encyclopedias. They say in the beginning that when people, all Christians that were baptized, converts that were baptized in water, they came, they repented, they got baptized, and they came out of the water speaking with tongues. They almost all. A lot of sources say they just automatically came out of the water speaking with tongues. In fact, our own traditions have unfortunately dissected this whole thing. I came into what is called traditional Pentecostalism. You, you come, you hear the preaching, you feel convicted of your sin, uh, you go through all of this, you come to an altar, you repent, then the next service you come back and you get baptized in Jesus' name, then the next service you come back and begin to tarry for the Holy Ghost. That's very traditional. It has nothing to do with apostolic truth. Nothing at all. Because when you're born again, it should all come at once. When a baby's born in the natural, you don't get a leg this week and an arm next week and a head the next week. You get the whole baby all at once. When you repent of your sins, you should get in the water and come out of it speaking with tongues. You, the birth should all come at once. We have dissected this. So that gives all kinds of, of uh, reasons and all kinds of theological discussions about where is the blood applied? When does it happen? Forget it. You've, you've dissected the baby. You've torn it all apart. You, when you come to God, you should get it all at once. If you're really repented, you should get the Holy Ghost, and let's get you to water. Not tonight, but now. Mm. In Jesus' name, <laughs> let's worship the Lord for a moment. Can you feel revelation in this house? You can feel it. Oh. Hallelujah, Jesus. I worship you, God. Again, give us revelation, understanding by the authority of the Word of God, by the power of the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Wrap your arms of love around us. Lift us into a realm that we've never been in before. I give you praise for it. I give you worship for it, God, in the blessed and wonderful name of Jesus of Nazareth. So under this fourth curtain that covered the tabernacle, when you pulled it away, inside the walls were pure gold. They were wooden panels, acacia wood, that was covered with solid gold. So <clears throat> it was the holy place and the holiest of holies. So here you have the death, the sacrifice, repentance, the washing, and to enter into the holy place was a type of receiving 
the Holy Ghost. So, if you walked up to the entrance of this holy place, it would look something like this. It was a magnificent curtain, beautifully done. And if you went inside the holy place, it would look like this. The walls were pure gold. The ceiling was magnificent. It was white linen woof embroidered again with blue, scarlet, and purple. And the veil itself was magnificently embroidered with cherubim upon it. But inside, outside, the furniture was brazen brass, mirrored brass, but in here, it's gold. The candlestick was on your immediate left. That candlestick represented... It represented the light of God. The candlestick was solid gold. It represented the light of God. Of all the elements, light is the most mysterious. You can reflect light through a prism and you'll get a rainbow. God is like that. So the candlestick represented the Spirit of God. And again, it was magnificently carved, knobs and bowls, and beautifully ornate, magnificent to look at, and priceless. I don't know that anyone really knows the actual value of this solid gold candlestick, nor did they know exactly its dimensions. But it sat directly on the left. Notice this on the sand. Is this not amazing? The walls are gold. The ceiling is magnificent. Everything around you is magnificent. Gold, embroider, work of art. But the floor of the tabernacle was sand. What's that all about? to remind us that we're still on planet Earth. And if you always spend all of your time looking down, all you're going to see is sand. But if you can find the grace to lift your eyes, as David of old said, I will lift mine eyes unto the hills, for whence cometh my strength, my strength cometh from the Lord. If you keep looking up, that's where the beauty is. That's where the beauty is. If you look down, all you'll ever see is the garbage in the gutter. But if you just look up, that's where the beauty is. That is the lesson that is being taught here. No matter where you're walking, just lift your eyes and look up. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So the candlestick, solid gold, represented the light or the Spirit of God. What's interesting about this, the candlestick, the priest came in and lighted it in the evening when the day was done, so there'd be light in the tabernacle through the night. But in the morning, when the sun came up, and the true sun arose. There was no need for this artificial light. And the priest came in in the morning and snuffed out the candlestick. It's a type of when the true sun of righteousness came, this tabernacle would be snuffed out. There was no need for it. On the right was the <clears throat> table of showbread. Again, it's solid gold. There were loaves of bread brought, 12 loaves of bread brought, baked by the Kothites, brought in once a week. The rabbis will tell you at the Temple Institute that this bread never became stale. The priest ate from this bread 
in the tabernacle. They were required to eat it. But the bread had to be eaten in the tabernacle, not outside the tabernacle. It's a type of, Jesus said, I am the bread of life. The Bible is the word, the bread of life. You need to eat this bread inside the tabernacle, not out there on your own in the world. In other words, don't think that you can just stay home and have church in your own house and live for God by yourself. You need to eat this bread in the church, in the tabernacle. That's where it was eaten, not outside. Because you need the fellowship one of another. I can worship God by myself, but if I can get you to worship with me, we can magnify him. And that's what church is all about, because you've got an anointing, and I've got an anointing, and your anointing comes on me, and mine comes on you, and we flow back and forth, and our strength becomes your strength, and your strength becomes our strength. It is the will of God we always eat this bread of life in the tabernacle, in the church. That's why the Bible says, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together so much more as, so as you see the day approaching. We need the house of God like we've never needed the house of God before. This is a refuge here. This is a sanctuary here. This is an escape from all of that that's out there. We can come here and close our minds and hearts to all of that, and we can fly away and rest in the bosom of Jesus right here in this sanctuary. This is place is hallowed, not because of the building, because the church of the living God, which our people are here, you have hallowed this place, you have sanctified this place as a refuge for the perishing and as a strength for the saints of Almighty God. Amen? This table of showbread was gold, but it was not ornate. The table represented the ministry. It wasn't the table that was so important. It was the bread that was on the table that you ate. They didn't eat the table. They ate the bread on the table. So, what the lesson is here, it's not the table that's so important. The, the, the candlestick was ornate, beautifully, beautifully carved and put together. But the table of Shobat, it was gold, it was valuable, the ministry is valuable, but it's not supposed to be ornate. It's not in miters and scepters and long flowing robes. It's not the table, it's the bread. It's what you hold up. That's what they eat. In other words, I don't know what a preacher is supposed to look like. I know what he's supposed to sound like, and that's what I major in. If you notice, I wear the same suits all the time. You know why? Because they're heavy duty suits. They take heavy duty work. I'm, this, this, this is my workplace. These are my work clothes. These will go through the sweat and the perspiration and crawling and people handling you and praying for people to get the Holy Ghost. I have to have heavy duty work clothes. <laughs> and when it gets hot, I take the tie off. It lets the heat out. That's what I'm doing. You have to do it. I've got some nice suits at home, but I wear them to funerals and to weddings and to go out tonight. They'd never get through the kind of preaching I do. About two preaching sessions, they'd be ready for the cleaners or destroyed. So this is heavy-duty stuff, <laughs> and that's what it's all about. It's not what you look like, it's what you sound like that makes the difference. So the table was gold, but it was the bread that was of utmost importance. <clears throat> and then, directly in front of the veil was the altar of incense. The altar of incense, again, was gold. And upon this altar of incense, there was a magnificent recipe of special ingredients that were put together and they were burned on this altar. They say that the fragrance was absolutely heavenly. What's interesting about it is that all the ingredients had to burn together for the proper fragrance. In other words, if one piece burned alone, it didn't smell just right. You know, in some congregations, I've noticed, 
When we all worship together, it smells right. If you just got one person over there doing their thing, screaming above everybody else, it, it doesn't just sound just, it doesn't feel just right, it doesn't smell just right. You know what I mean? We all need to get, in this to the, get into this together. And that's what I like about Singapore, you people here in Asia and all of these places you come from. You all get in there and worship together. There's not one or two carrying, there's not one or two carrying the whole thing. You're all into it. In other words, you're all fanatics, and that's what I like. And that's what God likes. Because if you worship Him, do you understand me when I say to you that worship is the prerequisite to the miraculous? If you want a miracle, stop begging and whining. Just worship. You don't deserve it anyhow. None of us did. But just worship. It will cause God to lower the scepter to you. He will lower the scepter to you. That Syrophoenician woman got in before the Gentile dispensation was ever opened. She came and said, God. She said, do this for my daughter. Whatever. And he looked at her and he said, it's not fit or proper. to take the children's meat and cast it to dogs. He called her a dog. I'm talking about Jesus here. He called her a dog. Didn't faze her. She said, yea, Lord, but even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. In other words, she worshiped him. She acknowledged who he was. And he opened the door to a Gentile with the miraculous before the Holy Ghost ever fell. She got in before the Gentile dispensation was ever, ever open because she dared to worship him in spirit and in truth and recognized him as Lord. You want a miracle? You worship God. Forget your failures. Forget your faults. Forget who you are. Just worship God. Just worship God. Yea, Lord. Yea, Lord. Hallelujah, Hallelujah Jesus. Hallelujah. And so at the time of the Temple of Solomon, they say that when they came and burned incense in the Temple of Solomon, that the fragrance, the incense, it, it was so great, it came out of the temple and it wafted down through the hills and the valleys all the way to Jericho. And they say that the donkeys in the streets of Jericho would sneeze just f smelling the fragrance of the incense that was burning at the temple in Jerusalem. They will tell you at the Temple Institute that when in, the, in all of this, the Temple of Solomon, in this tabernacle, especially the Temple of Solomon, when they, that brazen altar, when they offered those blood sacrifices in that fire, they said no matter how hard the wind blew, that smoke always rose in a perfectly straight line. And in spite of all the animals that were slain, the blood and the gore on the Temple Mount, through the time of Solomon and all of those periods and all that time, they never saw one fly on the Temple Mount. This whole thing is miraculous, people. This whole thing is miraculous from beginning to end. It's a miracle I'm here. It's a miracle you're here. It's a miracle we have what we have. You're a miracle. We are miracles. He has filled us with his spirit. We are alive forevermore. You are right now alive for eternity. No matter what happens to the body, you're already living for eternity. God has fused his eternal spirit with you. You are filled with his spirit. You've got resurrection power inside of you. That's who you are. See, that's who I am. Look at your neighbor say, wake up to it. <laughs> I feel like clapping and shouting, but I have to keep going. But I just can feel the presence of God in this place. Jesus, I worship you. Mm. The altar of incense... Beautiful. That's what Zacharias was doing when he went in and the angel came, Gabriel, and told him about John the Baptist would be born to him and to his wife. So now you're standing here before the veil itself. But we have a high priest here. 
On the Day of Atonement, the high priest, there were brought to him two goats without blemish. They cast lots. One goat was slain. The other goat, the high priest, laid his hands on the head of that goat, and it was called the scapegoat. And that scapegoat was led out into the wilderness so far from the camp, he could never get back. It was a type of when God forgives your sins, they are gone so far. He has cast, God has literally cast our sins into his sea of forgetfulness. And he puts up a big sign that says, no fishing. Even the devil, once God has forgiven you, even the devil cannot fish that out. Don't let him try. Don't let him try. Just worship God and say, devil, they're gone. I'm clean. I'm new. I'm whole. I'm never going back because I don't have to go back. I don't have to go back. But one of those goats was slain, and one of those goats became the scapegoat. The goat that was slain, whose blood <clears throat> was taken, and it was sprinkled, this blood on the Day of Atonement was sprinkled on all the pieces of the furniture. The high priest sprinkled it on the brazen altar. He sprinkled it on the mirrored brass laver. He sprinkled it on the candlestick. He sprinkled it on the uh, table of showbread. He sprinkled it on the ark, the uh, altar of incense. He sprinkled it on this veil, and it went behind the veil, and he sprinkled it on the lid of the ark, which we will come back to. But this high priest, all the days of the year, wore these royal robes. They were magnificently done, and on the, his breast was the Urim and the Thummim, the breastplate, the twelve precious stones. On the hem of this garment, there was a bell and a pomegranate, a bell and a pomegranate, a bell and a pomegranate, all the way around the hem of that royal robe. So anyone would have recognized the high priest because of his royal attire, magnificent mitre. But on the Day of Atonement, the high priest was required to go in to the holy place, take off those royal robes, and put on just plain white linen robes. So when the high priest came out on the Day of Atonement, nobody would recognize him. He was just dressed in plain white linen like all of the other priests. He made, he officiated the atonement on the Day of Atonement, the sprinkling of the blood, all the things I've already discussed. He took care of all of that. But when the atonement was made and the blood was sprinkled on the lid of that ark, which I'll come back to, <clears throat> he came out and the <clears throat> of the holiest of holies behind this veil. He walked in in plain white robes. Once the atonement was made, he, in this holy place, put these royal robes back on. And he came out. Jesus is our high priest. When he came into this world to make the atonement, he came in plain white linen robes of just simple flesh. And they didn't recognize him. But he has gone back into that holy place. And when he comes the next time, he will come back with those royal robes. And the whole world will know who he is. And those bells on the hem of this robe represented the gifts of the Spirit. The pomegranate represented the fruit of the Spirit. And the people had watched him do all of this, the whole camp. 
And they saw him go in in these plain white linen robes. And they waited. They saw the Shekinah fall when the wrath came down upon the blood that was sprinkled on the lid of the ark. Mm. And they waited. The high priest put those royal robes back on. And when he began to walk out of the holy place, back into the congregation, the bells began to ring and the people knew he was coming. Those bells represent the gifts of the Spirit. One of the reasons we know Jesus will come in our day is because the gifts of the Spirit are being restored to the church worldwide. The bells are beginning to ring. He's on his way out of that holy place into this present world. You can feel it. Ugh. Lift your hands and let your voice out for a moment. Jesus! Hallelujah, hallelujah. That's it, that's it, that's it. Let your voice out in the name of Jesus. Handle of Reco Shatai of Reco Shatai of Lechashol of Raka Shatai. Jesus, help us to be in the rapture. Even so, Lord Jesus, come quickly. I give you praise. We give you praise in the wonderful, wonderful name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hatal of Reco Shaya. Hallelujah, Jesus. So the high priest, when he went behind this veil into the holiest of holies, there was no need of a candlestick there, for the glory of God lighted the holiest of holies. In the holiest of holies, there was this Ark of the Covenant. And the Ark of the Covenant was, again, solid gold. And it was cherubim on the lid of this ark. And if you'll notice, they looked inward like this. Why? Because the glory of God dwelt between the wings of cherubim over the lid of this ark. So the angels were gazing continuously into the glory of God. That's where we should get to, to continuously gaze into the glory of God. They constantly looked into it from their faces into the glory of God that dwelt on the lid of this ark. Here is what is so incredible about this. When that high priest walked in carrying that blood, having sprinkled it on all the other seven pieces of furniture, when the high priest came in, he sprinkled that blood on the lid of this ark. And when he did, the Shekinah, or the wrath of God, came down against the sins of the people. But when the, the glory of God, when God saw that innocent blood, that wrath changed to mercy. That's why they called the lid of the ark the mercy seat. Because when the wrath fell and saw that innocent blood, it changed to mercy. That's why when a sinner comes to God, they feel the wrath of God against their sins. But the moment they kneel and the wrath falls, it sees the innocent blood of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world, and that wrath changes to mercy, and the feeling is unbelievable. There is a glorious experience in repentance. Mm. Mercy sat upon the lid of this gold box for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. But one day, in the temple in Jerusalem, 
Mercy heard the voice of a 12-year-old boy, and Mercy leaped from the lid of that ark and raced to that veil and ran her fingers along the edges looking for an opening to get through, but there was no opening to get through. And the voice of that 12-year-old boy became silent, and Mercy went back and sat on the lid of this ark. Several years later, that voice in adulthood cried out again in the temple, and Mercy leaped and ran to that veil and ran her fingers looking for an opening, wanting to escape into the world to be merciful. But there was no opening, and so Mercy went back and again became seated upon just the lid of this gold box. But then a few years later, some distance outside the city walls, on a hillside, came a voice that cried, It is finished. And in that temple, suddenly, there was a tearing, there was a ripping, and the veil in the temple was rent in twain from top to bottom, which was a miracle in itself. It couldn't have been torn from the top to the bottom, but it was torn from the top to the bottom. And mercy leaped through that area and came to that riven veil and ran her fingers along the shredded veil. And the history says that the veil rent, the shreds looked like human flesh hanging. And mercy leaped through that riven veil and ran into the streets in Jerusalem and found a blood trail and began to follow that blood trail and followed it to the brow of Golgotha. And there, hanging, suspended between heaven and earth, was the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. And mercy ran to him and said, I plead with you to the very throne of God. Don't ever let me be imprisoned behind a veil on a gold box, but let me ride on the shoulders of men. May I ever be carried on the shoulders of men. And from that time on, mercy is free in this world, riding on the shoulders of men. Every time you hear a preacher preach, if you look closely on his shoulder, you can see mercy. Mercy smiling at you, reaching for you. Mercy got free. That's why we are here today, tonight, as we are. I feel like standing and giving this great God, this Jesus, a standing ovation. That's it. Uh. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs>